it's it's such a joy to, uh, working with uh, uh, Jun Yi uh, for this uh, project. First, uh, we chose to do uh, three uh, the asymmetric uh, cases: uh, the United States uh, uh, and the UK and Taiwan. And do so, we we chose to do so purposefully. Uh, the United States uh, is a hegemonic power. Uh, the United Kingdom is a great power, and Taiwan is a small power, and arguably uh, middle power, uh, if uh, semiconductors and soft powers are weighed in. These are three nations uh, each uh, were sort of having the uh, major elections or direct uh, the democracy's uh, uh, events. Uh, that were uh, the uh, extraordinary uh, con uh, consequences. Uh, that would uh, uh, the, uh, be uh, redefining uh, its uh, uh, respective external uh, relations. For the United States, its role in, role in the world for the United Kingdom, its ties with the EU, and for Taiwan, its relations with the uh, with a formidable uh, the uh, authoritarian regimes at the other side of the strait. Yeah. So that's point number one. Why we landed on the three cases. Second, I believe the basis uh, baseline uh, for our projects, uh, the uh, our two conferences and the uh, papers that came out of them. Uh, was the rise of the uh, populist forces uh, in an age of the uh, globalizations and uh, unfettered uh, the social uh, media. And we would like to uh, examine the ebbs and flows uh, of these uh, political tides. Uh, we hope to find out uh, the, how the populist forces uh, have been uh, blended into and also impacting uh, the electoral processes uh, party systems and the social political uh, discourse, really. Yeah. So that's kind of you know, sort of kind of a kickoff point there. And and the third point, uh, uh, the third remark, really, uh, it's not a remark. It's really a thank you note. Uh, we we have a dream team of the uh, uh, authors uh, that you see today, uh, and designated uh, commentators, and all of them been you know, so well versed uh, in the. Uh, uh, public opinions, uh, studies, uh, uh, the uh, party systems, uh, uh, social political uh, uh, movements, uh, political economies, and, and, and social media. And all of them so devoted you know, to these projects uh, that uh, Juni and I uh, would never be able to thank them enough. Yeah. So it's just, you know, sort of three brief uh, remarks uh, for, you know, to kick off today's events. Uh, the floor is back to you. Uh, Juni. Yeah. Yes, thank you, TJ. I just want to second to what you said that this project uh, is a project that I've ever worked with so many different experts because I am in the field of Taiwan studies and in the field of political economy. I'm not in the field of American study. I'm not in the field of, although I'm in the UK university, I'm not in the field of the public opinion in the UK. So it has been a quite adventure journey for me. And I really, I'm really, really grateful to TJ who has been supportive all the time, no matter how. <laughs> and uh, I really also very, uh, very, very grateful to all of our contributors. Um, it has been a great journey. It has, I have learned so much from you. And uh, I think this is what really motivates me and also the colleagues of the Taiwan Study actually to move on and to get to understand new things. Uh, those things what originally I wouldn't think related to Taiwan, but there's something in common. Populism phenomenon happened, as TJ mentioned, in all three countries, big, middle, small power. And in this sense that this is why I think the project itself is interesting to me. And I thought it would be even probably more interesting to our audience today that we would be able to hear from our authors to talk about their perspectives. And I titled this uh, event as when authors met critics. So audience are credits as well. So of course, this is more appreciative if we will be able to have more dynamic discussion afterwards. So in order to ensure we have 
good discussion. Now I think I would like to invite our first paper author, uh, Roger, if you would like to speak about your paper and to introduce what's the core uh, elements of your paper. And I just introduce you a little bit as Roger is a professor of public opinion and political analysis in the Department of Political Economy, King's College, London. Thank you, Roger, please. OK, thank you. My paper is about opinion polls and populism in recent years in the UK. I won't dwell on the part about the polls, which I think is probably of less real interest to, to, to people here, but just to make the point that polls are an important, significant part of elections in Britain. Um, there are two or three conducted every day during an election. Um, they have high prominence in the media coverage of elections. So in 2015, almost three quarters of all television news bulletins in the final week before the election mentioned opinion polls. And the state of the polls can set the mood during the election and it can even set the agenda. So they have the potential for a significant political effect. Looking at populism in the UK, obviously the, the most obvious recent example is Brexit, the vote to leave the European Union. I think it's important to understand this isn't the only recent big populist movement in Britain. The Labour Party in 2017 in the general election when they were led by Jeremy Corbyn, their strategy was very much a populist one. It was centred very much on Corbyn as leader and was surprisingly successful. The Labour Party got many more votes than they were expected to get. And the Scottish independence movement as well is very much a left-wing populist movement. They um, there was a referendum in 2014 when Scotland voted relatively narrowly against independence to stay in the UK. All of these three movements drew on discontent and disillusionment with the political system to find millions of new voters among groups of the population who recently have not voted, um, you know, have normally had poor turnout. Looking at the specific case of Brexit, who was it who voted for Brexit? It was in particular um, older, white, working class male voters. And they were concentrated in what we call the, the left behind areas, areas where heavy industry used to be the economic staple, which have suffered economically for many years and where the population seemed to blame the establishment, to blame governments, to blame London for the fact that they've not received their fair share of Britain's prosperity since then. And there was also a very strong correlation between support for Brexit and opposition to immigration. And I think that's an important factor because that opposition to immigration was already one of the significant political factors in British politics. Where might opinion polls come into this in, 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 in the operation of populism? Various ideas that are discussed in the literature. Polls might simply allow politicians to be more responsive to public opinion. Um, polls might help spread populist ideas through what are called bandwagon effects. In other words, when the public see that an idea is popular, it makes it more likely that they will also support it. Very importantly, the media may use polls to claim that they are speaking as a representative of the public. So they, they use the evidence of polls to show that their campaigns are campaigns that the public support. Also, I think a big factor, the media's strategic game framing, the way in which they describe elections as a game and they portray the way in which politicians go about their business as part of a, a competitive game is a big part of the way the media in most countries these days covers elections. It is known to have a, a depressing effect on the public. The public don't like it. It disillusions them with the whole political system. And the use of opinion polls in assessing public opinion is a big part of that strategic game framing that the media carry out. So the, the, there are reasons to think that opinion polls might be a part of the rise of populism. When we look specifically at the Brexit case, there are some very clear factors where it is relevant, some where it's not. Historically, um, the publication of polls by anti-European newspapers was a big part of the way in which they covered this issue. They, 
um, enabled them to express their opposition to Europe and to claim the public's backing on it. But it was an issue where most of those polls did show that the public did back them. The, the, the anti-European movement is not something that was conjured out of the air in, in six months in, in 2014, 2016. It's been there for many years and a significant part of the British political scene. Secondly, there is some past evidence of a bandwagon effect in polls on Europe. There's academic research that shows that polls showing that other members of the public are opposed to Europe does increase support for anti-European um, issues. However, there is no sign that the polls swayed opinions during the referendum campaign or that either side was, was trying to achieve that. I mean, both sides were encouraging doubt about the outcome. They weren't trying to um, impress the voters that, that they were ahead and that one idea was better supported than the other. But the one other factor where it becomes very important is simply around the decision to hold a referendum in the first place. And here the polls were pointing in both directions. When David Cameron promised to hold a referendum, he did so at least partly on the basis of the opinion polls showing him that this issue was damaging his party and was reducing their chances of winning the next election. So the polls were feeding into his strategic motivation for taking this decision. But the polls, if he'd read them properly, should also have told him that this was a risk. It's very clear that David Cameron thought that he would win the referendum and that Britain would vote to stay in the EU, and he was wrong. And if he'd looked at the polls and seen the evidence that the public at that time was prepared to vote against Europe, then he shouldn't have been nearly as sure of, of taking that decision as he was. Thank you, Roger. Yeah, so the Brexit as the what in this country we are still, I think, continuously suffering the consequences and appear to be the polls signaled, but not really been taking a notice of uh, what happened. So in that sense, there's no uh, referendum in America, but it's a, a presidential election which creates a Trumpian phenomena, I would say, quite extraordinary phenomena, if you like. So I, I'm now introducing our second uh, paper author, uh, Thomas Griven, who will be talking about U.S. party politics and the peculiar nature of American populism. A quick note that Thomas is a professor of political science at Free University in Berlin. So, Thomas, the floor is yours, please. Thank you so much, uh, and uh, I would really um, thank um, the organizers of this event and the two previous events and the special issue, which was indeed a, a wonderful occasion to present ideas and discuss ideas. Um, yeah, I'm, um, I'm, I'm tempted to um, basically almost skip uh, the, the paper and to talk about more recent developments, because um, as we all know, um, um, since the publication of the paper, uh, the situation has not improved in the United States. Uh, as a matter of fact, if I were to name a paper today, um, and I've written papers since, uh, unfortunately, in, in German, but if I were, were to, uh, to title a paper now in English, I would call it uh, something like uh, a constitutional crisis in waiting or democracy in peril, or even in the words of the comedian Bill Maher, uh, a slow coup. Because um, what I was talking about in the paper was tracing back, um, if you will, the, the success story of Trumpism or Trumpian populism to its roots in the history uh, of the Republican Party. Um, you can trace back some elements of this to the very beginning of the Republican Party in the 1850s, namely the nativist anti-immigrant sentiment, uh, the use of religion to divide and rule. It was Catholicism back then, it is Islam today. Uh, you can trace back the anti-establishment um, element to the Gingrich, the so-called Gingrich Revolution uh, of the 1990s, where this instrument that Trump has perfected 
of using the threat of primary challenges for office holders to discipline them. Um, this is um, a very important element until today, uh, which explains um, how Trump, even as a defeated president, is still able to wield uh, this power over the Republican establishment because of his hold on the, the Republican base, which is sort of like a cult following for him. Now, this again traces back to the Tea Party movement uh, of the early Obama years when um, this fear and anger of white Christians who are increasingly in the, in the minority or who see that the demographic trends will put them into a position as a, uh, as a minority vis-a-vis uh, -vis uh, the, the, the sum of the, 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 the so-called minorities, uh, so-called majority minority society has been slowed down a little bit by Trumpian anti-immigrant policies, but it's still very much the prospect that this shrinking group of white Christian voters is facing. And the Republican Party has essentially become the sole representative of this group. However, um, and this is where it gets really interesting, and this is what we have seen in the 2020 election, and it's the, uh, the one surprising element um, that distinguishes Trump from previous usages of this toolbox of, of strategies that I mentioned. Um, there's also his celebrity status and all of that, but I, I don't want to focus on that. I want to focus on economic populism. As that is really the one thing that was not taken from a successful Republican strategy, but interestingly from an unsuccessful Republican strategy from the 1980s. And it is really the realm where the Democratic Party should have an advantage. I, I discuss in the paper also why the Democrats are not using this uh, to their advantage, but let's focus on the Republicans here. In the 1980s, Pat Buchanan wanted to become the presidential nominee for the Republican parties on uh, an anti-free trade, anti-globalization platform, also an anti-immigration platform, but that's not, not the distinguishing factor. What's the distinguishing factor is this element of economic populism by saying, I have a solution for your economic woos. Let's restrict market competition. I will restrict market competition by excluding immigration as much as I can. That's a classic. Even though the business community of the Republican Party uh, cherishes immigration because it keeps labor costs down. But also let's, uh, let's be more protectionist. And P Trump picked up on that. And interestingly, um, that is what put him over the top in 2016. There are many reasons why this did not work as well in 2020. One is that his policies didn't follow suit. They're, the trade wars that he started weren't, uh, weren't conclusive and they certainly weren't successful. And I don't want to get into the, into the reasons for the, for the defeat of Trump in 2020, only to highlight the fact that it was very, very, very close. Um, people do not tend to realize how close it was came down to 45,000 votes in three states. Now, the fact of that this was so close and the fact that economic populism and the other populisms remained part of the, the, the Republican, the Trumpian playbook, um, uh, goes to show you that it's not out of the question that with this kind of strategy, the Republican Party and Trump or another candidate could win again in 2024. Um, the Republicans have so many structural advantages in the American constitutional system because it favors uh, a rural states with small populations and that's where Republicans, that's where white Christians live and that's where the Republicans are strong. And we've seen some movement of working class people of color towards the Republican Party, which is the most 
shocking element of the 2020 election that this strategy seems to not just work for uh, white working class males especially but women also now it seems to be working for some african american and some latino working class voters as well it is to do with the fact that uh, this economic populism is an attempt to restrict uh, labor market competition. And we see a time and again that um, established immigrants that are citizens um, can in fact turn against other immigrants who are not yet citizens. That's not by itself a surprising phenomenon. However, what I wanted to um, uh, what what I wanted to say in addition to this to this uh, um, main argument of the paper is that, the Republicans are not content to enjoy their structural advantages. They're not content with uh, the fact that uh, their obstructionism in Congress seems to work in the sense that Biden cannot get many things done. Um, they are actively working to undermine democratic institutions in the United States. Um, in the paper, I mentioned some traditional strategies um, that are that now have been increased: voter suppression, specifically targeting minority voters and young voters uh, by various means; uh, gerrymandering, which is uh, a process that happens every that can happen every ten years after the census. That is now, so this means using the reapportionment and redistricting process after the census to tailor congressional house of representatives seats so that um, republicans um, can gain more seats than they deserve and to put it uh, uh, succinctly and then and this is the new development that i did not mention in the paper and that um, should have us all worried especially given the fact that democrats have been unsuccessful in countering any and all of these developments. The other process that's been going on very strategically is to undermine the system of poll workers. So the whole structure that holds up the electoral system, all the many people that have to work very hard to make sure that there is election integrity, that votes are counted properly, there's a strategic effort to replace all of these people with, with Trumpian loyalists. Um, and that really should have us all worried. Um, and we cannot expect uh, that the courts will save American democracy because Trump, that was the, his, the area of his most, most sustainable success by um, um, naming, uh, getting confirmed very, very conservative uh, judges all over the place. Um, final statement, I was among the people who said that it will possibly come down to the military. And uh, of course, um, me and uh, other colleagues who've said that were accused of alarmism by quite a, quite a few people. But uh, as you all know, we have found out that uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of uh, uh, Staff, Mark Milley, um, actually took action because of a fear that Trump may use the United States armed forces to start a foreign war or worse, uh, well, not worse, but to start a foreign war or an internal uh, um, confrontation. And I'll end it with this. I think um, Democrats, uh, citizens of all kind are very, very well um, advised to try to do all that is in their power to safeguard uh, the democratic institutions in the United States, because they are, uh, again, they are very much in peril. Thanks. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. And uh, I just wanted to also second on the economic populism, which will also be introduced by waiting at the end of our uh, sort of presentation, because she's talking about that in Taiwan. But before that, I think uh, as Trumpism is such a fascinating 
phenomena John Hubbard is a senior lecturer in the U.S. Politics in School of Social, Political, and Global Studies at Keio University. Um, thank you, and the uh, floor is yours. Firstly, thank you for inviting me along to this event and the preceding events. Um, it's been really interesting hearing things from the comparative perspective, hearing what Thomas has to say about the US. I've really, I've really enjoyed it. So thank you to Chun Yi, to TJ, to Mandy, to Charlotte, to Ryan for getting this all organised. I've really, really appreciated it. So um, the argument I made um, in the paper was looking at rather than the public phenomenon of populism, but how a populist president could try to govern. Uh, that was the question I was grappling with. I was particularly looking at the unusual alignment, um, in American terms, an unusual alignment of shackling a deeply populist anti-establishment president to an establishment party. Obviously, there was an expectation there would be enormous clashes there. Um, and an awful lot of the uh, consensus around the uh, uh, Trump presidency and the scholarship on it is that Trump somehow dominated the Republican Party throughout his term. Um, and this really sort of is rooted in the kind of Bob Woodward fear argument that he won enormous support among the uh, grassroots of the party, among the public, and therefore was able to subdue the elite Republican establishment. And I've got quite a lot of discomfort with that sort of consensus argument. Um, I put a lot of emphasis on, instead on the idea that uh, the Republican Party and uh, Trump had to actually work out how to uh, work together in a kind of coalitional bargaining model. I The paper basically says, OK, um, let's look at the mutual dependence of party and presidency um and it, when actually trying to govern um and identifies three areas where the bargaining really takes place over so policy agenda pursuit of electoral success that is what strategy do they adopt and pursuit of power in office which is about um how executive power will be wielded and um, what the paper does is basically take set up that theoretical framework and then use trump as a case study to examine those three bargains uh, the policy, the institutional and the electoral. What I was really trying to get at is why didn't Republicans oppose Trump more? That That's the core question. Um, and I come to the conclusion that Republicans defer to Trump because he looked to be delivering on a number of their key priorities, uh, certainly a number of their policy priorities. There was an awful lot of shared uh, policy uh, concern there in terms of things like deregulation, tax cuts, uh, appointment of uh, conservative justices, as Thomas has mentioned, uh, the, perhaps the most long lasting part of his legacy when we, we when the historians look back on him. Um, he opened executive power up to Republican use through staffing um, and the broader administrative presidency. So uh, that was that was very important to Republicans. And of course, until the very end, he appeared electorally viable. His message looked to be getting through. He was serving as a um, effective leader. And actually, when you scrape the surface, he was pretty much willing to be a good partisan warrior. So these things encouraged elite tolerance of Trump. And the paper details this process of bargaining and development of a coalition here. Now, Chun Yi asked us to reflect on whether anything has changed and whether we might develop our arguments. So just for a couple of minutes, there are a few things that I think are quite interesting. Um, when I wrote the paper, I treated party as a kind of fixed point. So it was, OK, here's Trump the outsider, Republican Party is a fixed point. That was partly because Trump was so willing to defer to the party over things like uh, um, allowing uh, Republican establishment Republicans to run in 2018 without mustering um, opposition to them in the primaries. And Thomas is, of course, right to emphasise the importance of that tool. Uh, and he didn't actually show much interest early on in um, controlling the Republican Party mechanisms. So historically, I think the thing that we will do is look back at 2019 and early 2020 as a kind of key point in Trump's presidency, because what he does is try to take over the party mechanisms in ways that he hadn't done before that point. 
I think there's a real shift in the administration and I'm still trying to dig around, you know, since I've written the paper, I'm still thinking about these issues and I'm trying to dig around to try and understand better why that was possible after the defeats of 2018. It was partly about Trump's engagement. Um, I think it's perhaps partly about um, the arrival of Meadows um, in the White House as, a, as an influential figure. I think it's partly about COVID, which meant the party couldn't meet in the normal ways. I think that made the party vulnerable in, in interesting ways. But it's clearly mostly about Trump's decision to engage in a new way. Um, I don't think he understood what was going to happen to him when his party went down to defeat in the 2018 midterms and he confronted Pelosi as uh, Speaker of the House. I don't think he got that. It was only once he was there he realised that uh, the pursuit of his own power um, would depend on how the Republican Party ran. And I think he was encouraged by others around him to engage in a takeover of the party's commanding heights. So I do stand by my argument that the elite of the party consented to Trump's leadership, but Trump actually began to manoeuvre to change the direction of the party much more in the last couple of years. Um, and he built a foundation which actually is really important in his continuing influence today. We would normally expect um, the 2020 election to have been a stopping point for Trump's political career. All right, a defeated president, um, who fades off the scene because of the convention that defeated presidents go quiet and go quietly, uh, not Trump. Um, the defeat damages their credibility, which rather demands that everyone in the party believes it was a defeat, which of course he's undermined quite effectively. And we expect them to be influenced by the loss of the bully pulpit, something we would expect to be magnified by the loss of um, the use of Twitter. Um, but Trump has managed to establish important communication routes, not only um, using right wing media, but actually using the power he's built in the party. This attempt to take over state party mechanisms is really important in giving him a base within the party. So it's actually a contest within the elite now of um, certain uh, Trumpian Republicans against what we might call more establishment Republicans. So what happened late in the Trump presidency was really important in establishing the conflict within the party now, a Trumpian wing among the elite, as well as a mass Trumpian, mass Trumpian support. I've called it a slow burn legacy because this is going to play out over the next few years. And there are all kinds of interesting things we can discuss about this. But clearly, with Trump out of office, it's the electoral bargain that is the key element here. Previously, it was we'll allow Trump to run because he's won us the presidency and he then delivers other things for us in the other forms of the, of the bargain in, in the way I outline this in the paper. The issue that is playing out now is, is will the elite be able to tolerate Trump as he potentially sabotages them in 2022? Trump's continued message about the illegitimacy of the electoral system is going to discourage Republicans from voting. And this is really establishing enormous fear among the Republican establishment of allowing Trump a platform because they actually think he is overtly threatening um, those who don't support his interpretation of the 2020 election with Trump arriving in their district or in their state and saying, don't go out and vote for this Republican. So he's so obsessed with the election of 2020 and his own profile that he risks really badly hurting the party. That's going to be a fascinating battle to watch that play out and how the party responds to that if it does lead to defeats and they don't win on what ought to be a nice glide path. You know, Biden's struggling with uh, economic recovery. Biden's still struggling with COVID, struggling to get reforms through. The Republicans should be in a great position going into the 2022 midterms. And uh, the potential is they get sabotaged by Trump focusing still on 2020. So it's a fascinating picture to watch unfold. Obviously, there's a lot that may happen by then. Donald Trump might be in prison by then. You never know. Um, I suspect he won't end up in prison, but the legal fights may take over. His health situation might change. There may be all kinds of developments. You know, we're back to a week being a long time in politics to bring out that old chestnut. 
Um, but it's it's a fascinating thing watching play out. And I think my paper, if I was writing it again, I would add a, a, a chapter two, uh, which really got into the detail of that takeover and its repercussions for where we are now. Fascinating, John. And uh, I think that we have a Delta variant plus. We also have a Trumpian variant pl plus in that sense. Yeah. Uh, Trump die hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's fascinating. And, and, and on this, actually, you mentioned about the media and this actually which I would like to come back to you about the media thing later, but because it's also just very well connected to what Professor Ling and myself are working on the paper, uh, a different story of populism in Taiwan, which the populism figure, Han Guoyu, is not as, uh, uh, you know, um, strategic or, or appear to be not as strategic as Trump, that probably he, he would like to learn from Trump's uh, variant plus strategy. But what the paper Professor Ling and myself is argued, are arguing about is does press freedom come with responsibility? And it's about connected to what John you were just mentioned and also earlier Roger mentioned about the media uh, scenario, but we focus on Taiwan. We ask whether media are against populism in Taiwan. And I'm very honored to that I will be able to work with my university professor, Professor Lin Liyun, in the Graduate School of Journalism at National Taiwan University. So myself only actually serve to ask in the paper to ask this question. Well, uh, when we talk about this concept of press freedom, does that mean that the press freedom is uh, at all costs that the press can say everything that the press wanted to say because of this word freedom? And the reason that I, we would like to ask this question because during the rise of this populist figure in Taiwan, uh, Han Guoyu, who was campaigning for the uh, who won the Kaohsiung mayor in 2018 was a KMT uh, candidate and who won the Kaohsiung mayor election in 2018. And then he continued with these very uh, increasing and stronger popularities from grassroots, and especially from the um, coming of the uh, sort of the more of the pro-China camp uh, to compete with the current President Tsai Ing-wen in 2020. And during this period, actually, there was a television channel, CTI TV, which is lavishly promoting or broadcasting about the news about uh, Han and uh, very biased in a sense of not, ver not verifying the evidence, not fact-checking, and it's just out of proportion to uh, produce the report about Han in order to boost the popularity of Han. The paper we are writing along this process of this project, we, we actually wrote the chapter two in, in the paper because originally we are talking about Han's rise was boosted by the media because of Taiwanese media is also tabloid and also money driven wanted to uh, support of this populist figure. However, in the process of the writing of our paper, we realized that actually the, the very TV channel CTI TV was really doing overdoing too much of the uh, untruthful uh, reporting and also out of percentage reporting coverage. And at the end, that in November 2020, the CTI TV has been suspended uh, broadcasting lessons. And curiously, it's supposedly that the civil society in Taiwan should feel like this is a justice because the, the TV channel wasn't report truthfully. But actually, there are quite a number of the, or we heard a number of the voices to argue that the press freedom should be protected. And this is the, uh, the government intervention of the press freedom to, you know, to 
close down or to revoke the uh, broadcasting lessons of this particular channel. So our paper is coming from this broad angle in a sense of the media's bias reporting of supporting these populist figure. But Professor Lin will be able to uh, give us more of a, a on the ground uh, briefing because I'm coming from a, a rather sort of outside perspective to ask this question. So Professor Lin, if you don't mind, if you could speak with us about your finding like in brief of what is ha what has happened and what what has been continuous happening. Hello, um, good morning or good, good afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you today. Uh, following Jimmy, I would like to talk about the case of uh, CPI TV, populism, and Taiwan, Taiwan's discussions of press freedom. And in our theoretical reflection, we have uh, discussed uh, the meaning of uh, press freedom and uh, uh, press freedom and uh, uh, many, many press freedom. In our reflection, we have uh, talked about freedom of the press consists of two levels of freedom. One is the individual freedom of the owners from any censorship. The other is the citizens' collective freedom of, to be informed and to have influence. Therefore, in many countries, media regulations are required to, to restrict publishers' rights in order to protect the public from possible harm and to promote diversity of source, content, and so on. In media regulation, in particular, television has been considered as an important as great influence on society regarding mor morals of the young and public reasons and equality of political discussions. Therefore, the state or regulatory body licenses the operators for a period of time and the licenses carry some conditions and requirements, including mechanisms for self-regulation. And in Taiwan, regarding the license system, Channel operators should obtain a license from the regulator, that is, the National Communications Commission, to renew the license every six years. An external committee will issue the final verdict, while the committee makes the final decision. That is the correlated co regulation to invite the external, the representative of civil society, to issue the primary verdict and later. The, commit, the commission will make the final verdict. That is the, the part of the license. And con regarding media content, the public may, fi may file complaints about the content. And the NCC will launch an independent committee to review the relevant programs. And the committee members will decide. That is composed of the media scholars and the NGO groups will decide whether the content is in violation of regulations or not. And this system has been made, created after Taiwan's democratization to have a co-regulation. That is, we have a state body to, uh, to be in charge of the media of regulations. However, this state body would invite the participation of civil society. CTI TV is a 24 hour news channel. It belongs to a channel, to an owner of a port for China uh, Media Tycoon, that is one one group. And, but this channel has tension with Taiwanese civil society back to 2014 in the Sunflower Movement. The NGO group argued that CTI-TV has portrayed the movement in a false light. For example, it would exaggerate the uh, the bad behavior, the so-called bad behavior of the movement. So at that time, in twenty, in the in CTI TV's renewal of license in twenty fourteen, the external committee of the NCC has argued that the NCC should not give, should not renew the license of um, CTI TV at that time, back to twenty fourteen. However, the NCC com the NCC at that time. In, consider in consideration of press freedom, approve the license, the renewal. It's the requirements that CTI TV must strengthen its 
internal quality control mechanisms. In particular, in the mechanisms, it is required that the shareholder, that is the owner of one one group, should not intervene into the editorial policy or process of the C CTITV. So it was in the hope that the CTITV can function well in according to the uh, professional journalism expected in Taiwanese society. However, at the Han, during the election in 2018, CTITV brought huge prominence to Han, has given continuous coverage to him. Actually, it has devoted at that time, devoted 62% of the news time to a single politician, that is Mr. Han. Further, in supporting Han, CTRTV spread misinformation and uh, even uh, many manufacturer or uh, fault hole uh, signaling lab that Han was um, a god to save Taiwan's politics. So the NCC at that time renewed that the story breaches the principle of fact ver verification. And um, it was the uh, CTRTV was fine. Further, other CTRTV stories depicted the ruling party as a uh, corrupt elite party and whose media misadministration has sacrificed ordinary people. That, that is the news frame of uh, the populist news frame, but the figures and the stories were false or manufactured. At that time, citizens and the NGO groups began to take actions against the spread of populism, demanding the regulator, the NCC, to curb misinformation deliv delivered by CTI TV. For example, in 2019, in a single year, the NCC has received about 1,000 complaints from civil society in that single year, the election year. In response to, the, to these complaints, the NCC launched program renew, com, renew committees to consider whether this program have violated the regulations or not. And the, the, the ruling was that the CTIB has violated regulations. The contents was not the main reason for NCC's consideration of CTIB's renewal license. The main problem in CTITV's renewal license in 2020 was that NCC pointed out that CTITV has continued to violate the, the regulation. Further, CTITV failed to strengthen its internal uh, control, which it, CTITV has promised in 2014. In particular, the NCC identified the fundamental problem was that the channel, the channel's largest shareholder, that is the owner of one one group, has directly or indirectly intervened into the news production process. And this intervention was against the internal mechanism promised by C CTITV back to 2014. Therefore, and after NCC uh, made the ruling. Some media scholars and NGO group supported NCC's decision. They argued that uh, this ruling was did not go against press freedom because CTID had violated journalistic professionalism and had ign ignoring fact checking and due impartiality, and it did not have a, con a control mechanism. However. As Jim has just pointed out, that another part of the society, the supporters of Han and supporters of Jontian Group, argued that NCC should not intervene into uh, CTIDV's coverage because the owner or the channel operators have the freedom to decide this editorial policy. Therefore, we conclude that. The protest, this protest against city, uh, NCC's decision has indicated that the fun very fundamental or more serious issue within Taiwanese society, that is the misunderstanding or hijacking of the very meaning of press freedom 
because in our regulation, actually in our regulation, in Taiwan's regulation, or in, in many, as well as in many democratic countries, press freedom comes with uh, responsibility. That is the, in particular in television channel operators gain the license from the state and the license holders should have social responsibilities and promised in the license renewal process. This is our uh, presentation and the, our main finding. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ling. And just a note to say that I think it's the remaining force of CTI TV is still on YouTube channel. I think it's like the remaining force or coming back force of Trump. You know, it's still there, that's a point. And uh, um, then we are following to uh, Daffy's good paper because Daffy will talk about the challengers to mainstream parties in Taiwan's 2020 election, continuity rather than the expected change. And Daffy is a reader in comparative politics in Department of Politics at International Studies, School of Oriental African Studies, University of London. And David is also leading the uh, Taiwan Study Institute, Taiwan Study Research Center in SOAS. So David, please. Fantastic. Thanks very much, uh, Dri and, uh, and TJ. It's been a pleasure working with you on this, uh, this project. One of the great things about being in the Taiwan Studies field is we kind of get exposed to Taiwan from different disciplinary angles. So this project was quite refreshing because it kind of allowed us to think about Taiwan comparatively to other countries that often as uh, East Asianists, we don't kind of um, uh, look at the uh, our own country, UK and the uh, and the US. Um, so the starting point of, of my paper is political stability in Taiwan. What, I, um, what makes Taiwan's party system really kind of um, um, unique is the fact that since the first semi-democratic election in 1986, it's been the same two political parties that have dominated the, uh, the party system. Of course, they have faced um, numerous um, challenges over those last three and a half uh, decades. They faced the challenges of social movements and social movement linked political parties. They've had the challenges of splinter parties that are split away from the mainstream parties. And they've also faced the challenge of rebel candidates emerging from their own um, party ranks, such as in the 2000 presidential election, when a KMT rebel also almost uh, was elected uh, president. But what we've seen is that time and again, uh, the two mainstream parties have managed to overcome these challenges. If we think, for example, about um, the 2016 elections, uh, not long after the, uh, the Sunflower um, movement and occupa occupation of parliament. But ultimately, in the this next round of elections in 2016, we saw continuity, only limited change, not the kind of uh, earthquake that the Sunflower Movement might have led us to expect. If we go back to early 2019, and this is the kind of the starting point of, of my paper, it looks like the 2020 election wouldn't bring continuity. It looked like we would see a earthquake in Taiwan's party system in January of, of 2020. It looked like the mainstream parties were facing unprecedented uh, challenges to the status quo of the party system. Um, and what I do in uh, the first half of the paper is to outline these key unprecedented challenges. These included internal challenges. For example, for the first time, a sitting DDP president was being challenged in a presidential primary. Um, in the case of the main opposition party, the establishment candidate was being challenged by semi-outsiders, not pure outsiders, but semi-outsiders within his uh, party. We'd also seen a um, uh, election of change in November of 2018 in the local elections where uh, the KMT had won landslide majorities, partly on the back of referendum uh, campaigns. So it looked quite possible that we would see a repeat of the local um, elections of change at the national level 
just over a year uh, later. A further challenge uh, from outside the regular party system came from uh, the Taipei mayor, Koenza, um, who looked like he could run a competitive presidential election, according to the, the polls. And he also went on to create his own political party, which showed it had the potential to disrupt regular party politics, the Taiwan uh, People's Party. But also, I, I, if that wasn't enough in terms of challenges, we had uh, movement parties. The New Power Party had performed very well in the local elections in 2018. And there was a new um, pro-independence party, the state building party, um, emerging in this election, running a strong campaign. So the puzzle that I try and address in, the, uh, in much of this paper then is why despite these unprecedented challenges, do we actually see such a high degree of continuity? If we look both at the parliamentary balance of power, but also the presidential vote, it actually looks remarkably similar to what we saw four years earlier in 2016. And the way that I try to explain this um, puzzle of continuity is through three um, 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 themes. The first theme that I probably devote the most space to is the China factor. Uh, I think uh, we, many of us analysts would agree that without the China factor, probably we would have seen uh, the KMT um, coming to power, or at least a change of um, uh, ruling parties. Um, and the way that I conceptualize or operationalize the China factor is to look both at the impact of Chinese threats, such as Xi, Xi Jinping's uh, speech in January of 2019, but also the impact of the crackdown on Hong Kong protests. But it's not just the having these threats from China, uh, but it's also the way that the candidates uh, address this uh, issue um, and the way that they, um, to a large extent, the KMT uh, uh, mishandled the China um, uh, factor. Well, the DP was able to use uh, these threats and the Hong Kong suppression to its advantage. To a large degree, the DP owns the China issue in this election. This is critical to its ability um, to uh, retain um, uh, its majorities. But I also try to explain that in this election, it's not all down to China. Um, and here I particularly spend a bit of space looking at the shortcomings in the campaigns of the main challenger um, to uh, the um, um, DUP's and KMT's dominance. Uh, in particular, I look at the way that um, both uh, Coenta and Han Guoyu managed to alienate a lot of their uh, support base that had enabled them to win election at the local level in 2014 uh, for Ke and 2018 uh, for, uh, for Han Guoyu. Uh, and the final element that I look at is institutions and the way that institutions actually uh, promoted continuity in the party system. For example, I looked at the role of the nomination system within the, the DVP. Not only the way that the system operated mechanically, but also the way that the, uh, the party coped with um, uh, conflict internally and the way it was able to use its nomination system to reunite the party. But the other element of the, norm, of the institution that I look at is the electoral system and the way that the electoral system squeezed the space for these challenger parties, forcing them to only really be competitive on the party list. And because Taiwan's parliamentary election is largely determined by the single member district, which are dominated by mainstream parties, that limited the space for these new uh, challenger parties. And the final point that I wanted to make, which is kind of updating um, uh, the picture, is a new puzzle that I think is, is, is worth us thinking about in the, uh, the field of Taiwan studies. Um, and that's um, why do we see quite a different pattern post-election. In previous um, 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 presidential elections, when the incumbent wins re-election, they lose popularity very, very quickly. We saw this with Li Gehui uh, after 1996, Chen Shui-bian after 2004, and Ma ying after um, uh, 2012. But we see a quite a different pattern um, in, um, in 2020. The, the 
uh, re-elected incumbent has been surprisingly popular. I think that's a, a, a great puzzle for us to look at in the, um, uh, in the future. So thanks again, uh, TJ and, and Jeannie for inviting me to, to this project where I've learned so much. Thank you, David. I think this is uh, really important for us in a sense of observing the, the uh, party politics uh, evolving in Taiwan, which is we, we thought that would be just normal, but actually there are some changes. And we thought we saw the populist figure like Han Guoyu arose, but it doesn't really it didn't really move much. I think the, the point you mentioned about the China factor is the key one of the very important key to actually deter Han. This is the recording for Dr. Wei Ting Yan. She is assistant professor of the government department at Franklin and Marshall College in the States. And very regretfully that she's not able to be with us at the same time to present her excellent paper of this special issue. Therefore, this is uh, uh, the pre-recording for her, but all welcome for our audience participants to have questions and I can certainly relate to Dr. Yen. Now, floor is yours, please. Okay, uh, hi everyone. I'm uh, very sorry I cannot be uh, here in real time because I have teaching uh, obligations during this time slot. So uh, I'm going to give you uh, a very quick summary of what I did in this paper. So this paper is titled The Labor Market, uh, Economic Security and Populism uh, in Taiwan. And so the core idea of this paper is uh, I want to examine basically the social base of populism in Taiwan. As we know, since uh, Han Guoyu and Ke Wenzhe, uh, two atypical politicians rose to the political arena, it has been a very wide, like a, a very uh, big debate with respect to whether populism has gained traction uh, in Taiwan. And so uh, this question has been discussed very extensively in the political economy uh, literature, not necessarily in Taiwan, but elsewhere in the world. So when I uh, was doing a research on this topic, one thing that interests me in particular is to what extent uh, you know, we can use the eco political economy perspective to explain the rise of populism in Taiwan. So in this paper, I st specifically study the extent to which economic insecurity can contribute to uh, the social base of populism in Taiwan. That's one thing. And another thing I was also interested in is, was um, we know China factor has been a very big issue shaping the economic landscape in Taiwan. So I am uh, also interested to learn the extent to which the greater economic interdependence with China may say first directly contribute to people's economic insecurity feeling, which in turn may affect you know, their support for populism or people's attitude toward China perception of China's impacts on Taiwan directly have an impact on their populist attitude. So that's basically the, the, the two questions I'm trying to answer in this paper. The empirical strategy I use uh, was to use two waves of uh, Asian barometer survey. One wave is from 2014, the latest wave is from 2018. And there are two central findings uh, from this paper. First, I do find that economic insecurity matters, and particularly it's people who are worried about either their current income or their future income. These are the, the group, the societal base that is most vulnerable to the populist ideas, to both uh, uh, left-wing and la uh, right-wing populist uh, ideas. So that's the one finding. And the second main finding uh, from this paper is that I also found that economic uh, integration with China does have an impact. So basically, the uh, people who have uh, who perceive that China has a more negative, you know, impacts on Taiwan, those group of people are also going to be associated with higher support for populism, and both to left wing and right wing populism. And another thing I found is that the China factor is actually. Uh, 
not a proxy for economic security. These are they are independent from each other, which means that in Taiwan, what I found is we actually can see a two-dimensional social base for populist support in Taiwan. The one dimension is people's economic security level, specifically income and security level. But there's the second dimension along which uh, politicians can also mobilize their voters, and that is the China, the China dimension. But, so we can see in Taiwan the combination of, say, uh, a left-wing idea, uh, populist ideas, which is protection of you know, equality, social justice issue, but having a, a, a more like distance tight, like distance from China, that will be, you know, Cohen, his slogan back in 2014. But we can also see another combination in which we have also uh, promoting, you know, pro people, uh, more redistribution, but combining that idea with the pro closer to China kind of uh, stance. And that will be basically Han Guoyu in 2018, where he was saying like, you know, uh, we should have closer ties with China in order that everyone can you know, earn more money. Yeah, so that's kind of the, the, the basic uh, takeaway from this paper. Thank you. Thank you, Waiting. <laughs> I should relay the uh, questions to you as well. So. Uh, we definitely want to have you the same time, even better in person, hopefully. <laughs>